edition of the Lakers Locker Room. I'm your co-host, Tayshaun Graham. Alongside me is my guy, the one, the only, Mr. Jason Little. Jason, how are you doing today, my man? Fantastic. Thank you, Tayshaun. So today we got another great guest. She was so nice enough to come on our podcast last season as one of the panelists for International Women's Day. So we have to have her back on. Please welcome to Lakers Locker Room, Miss Megan Winter. Megan, how are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you for having me back. No doubt. I'm excited to have you. So let's get right into it. So 2020 was obviously a mess of a year. Um, we're over halfway through 2021. Looking back throughout the whole time during quarantine and everything went on with the pandemic, what was the one thing you say you learned about yourself? Ooh, um, I would say that I, like, I appreciated being alone more. Like, I feel like I was so busy and I would burn myself out with how much I was doing. And now I like, I'm not scared to be alone and have nothing to do. Like, I kind of appreciate that, but I also really appreciate the really busy lifestyle of being an athlete. And I'm so excited to get back into the swing of not having alone time. Do you find that finding that kind of self-love and being able to be by yourself is going to, you know, help prep you for the future when, you know, school's done and, you know, if volleyball continues or not, you know? For sure. I think, I think you have to like yourself and like being with yourself like that should be your favorite company because that's who you're with all the time. So, you know, um, taking the time through quarantine to not be afraid to paint or read or just sit alone and go for a walk alone. I think that's so good for the future when you have nothing to do with like, you have to like yourself first. So yeah, 100%. I think a lot of people have to really come to that realization that they have to be comfortable with themselves because even something simple as people don't like the sound of their own voice. Hell, I don't like the sound of my own voice, but stuff something like that we say used to. Last year, when you came on the podcast, you definitely were talked about, you know, you read a lot of books. And so a lot of people found different things that they like to do during quarantine. Was there anything else other than just reading books that you found was really helpful during the time during quarantine for you? Um, fitness. Like I, I like to work out and go for walks, especially now. I feel like everyone went through lulls and it was really hard to stay motivated last year when we didn't have a season. Like that was really, really tough. Um, and I'll be the first to admit, you know, you go through ruts of being like, why am I doing this? I don't want to do this right now. Um, so fitness was a really, really big thing. And just family time. Like I had the best time and as it's crappy to say, but I, I will never forget how much time I had with my family during this. And that was the only positive thing. That was awesome. Yeah, no doubt. Would you say, Cause we've, I've thought about this too, because the good thing about the pandemic was, like I said, I've said this many times, that it gave people time to really self-reflect. And as we're going through the season, there's always so many times where there's always, there's so many things going on. Like you said, there's your practices and weight room and like, you know, traveling, all that type of stuff. So we never really have the time to sit down. Over this period of time where we had no season, because obviously is we're about to enter the new season. Was there something that you realized in general, it, can be, it doesn't even have to be athletic space, it can be anything in my life, that you realized that you definitely took for granted, that you'll never take for granted again, because it, the pandemic took that away for you? I would just say hu- like human interaction. Like I just took that for granted and, you know, I'll compare it to being in a season. Like there were times when I was so tired that I didn't want to go out. I didn't want to, you know, have a movie night with the girls because I was so tired. And now it's like, I would give anything to go back and do that. And I know there will still be times when I'm tired and don't want to be social, but just being able to hug people and see your friends, I think is something I really took for granted. It's crazy talking about that. Like there was a study that just came out that with the pandemic going on, a lot of therapists are even saying themselves, we're at an all time high as a society for um, social anxiety. So with all of this, not, you know, being kind of locked up at home and by yourself, like that's kind of, it's crazy to think that people are at this stage where we can't even enter a social gathering right now comfortably. Well, it was weird today. I was talking to one of my coworkers about that because I was, we were having an interaction with one of the members of our club and I said, it's so weird because we haven't had interactions face to face with people in so long that it's like people forget how to have those interactions. Yeah. Yeah. I'm socially it's, awkward, you know? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. It's crazy because even people who are like super confident, like really confident around people, like the first time you even give someone a hug, it's like, oh my gosh, I can give someone a hug. Right? <laughs> it's like, whoa. So like, it's crazy. Cause like, I haven't seen teammates in like eight months. Like since we got shut down back in November, like we're coming back now. It's like, whoa, like it's going to be different. Like it's going to be different to actually be able to like touch people again, see how you're doing because it's been really crazy. Like online school is one thing, but the fact that we had to, a lot of people had to work online. A lot of people had to do different business um, meetings online. Like it's been a really crazy year. And it's honest to be, Honestly, I'm kind of excited that we're hopefully getting back to normal because, you know, vaccines are out now and, like, people are starting to, things are starting to open up again. So I'm really excited to see 
people in person again, like really actually get back to work because it's been too long. And I'm just, like I said, it's just, it's just a sigh of relief that things are finally starting to turn the court in the right way. Although there's all these talks of a potential fourth wave, but let's just, let's just hope that. Let's not talk about that. Not yeah, we're not. Let's not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> but that is going to lead us into the good thing though, is that Obviously, the 2020-21 season was a no-go, no-show, but there is going to be a 21-22 season. So how excited are you that there's going to be OE Wave Volleyball this year? I am so excited. I've never been so excited for something. I'm like, the girls are fired up. I've never seen them this excited for something. We just, we can't wait to get back into the gym. We're going back, not this weekend, the next weekend for a training weekend. And like, I will do fitness testing every day if it means I get to be back in the gym with the girls. And that says a lot. So That's crazy. Right? <laughs> yeah. And if you can pinpoint, what's the number one thing you're looking forward to? Is it hugging the girls? Is it the practice? Is it weight room? Is it the locker room? Like, what's the number one thing if you can pinpoint that you're looking forward to? Oh, okay. Well, I'll, number one will be seeing the girls, hugging the girls and seeing them all and stuff. But just being on the court together again, like I'm pumped to be back. And everyone has been working so hard that I'm just so excited to see where everyone has come. Like I know a lot of girls have been working their butt off and I just can't wait to see what they've done with the time that we've had off. And the crazy thing about it, too, we talked about this on other episodes, like it's a fresh new landscape. Like you don't know who is going to win. Like the people that dominated in years past are graduating now are gone and the good thing too is that it's a great opportunity for newcomers to come in in the scene like really make some noise because there's some people um who, who are retros their first year were looking to play last year didn't get the opportunity so this is gonna be their third year and this is gonna be actually their first year playing so like you said a lot of people are working hard like could you imagine the hunger of people waiting two years to actually really play volleyball basketball hockey soccer whatever the case it be so people are gonna be fired up so i'm just so excited to really see all these different athletes and one of the things that jason and I, we talked about too was like we're, I'm, we're definitely going to make it an effort to support the athletes more. Like we really got to find a way to support each other more because we saw with everything going on, like you saw with the professional teams, like people were saying, like, yo, like the fans and not in the arena is not the same. Like you need like the fans, like in that case with us, like if we can find a way to support each other, like I said, I'm going to go to the women's volleyball games, or women's basketball games, or men's volleyball games, wherever, like, and we can find a way as a community of athletes to come together and like really support each other more. I think it's just going to really propel us more. I think every team has the same sentiment that you have as a, yo, like we're all super, super excited. So what better way to show that excitement than to actually support each other as we play our games? Exactly. I think, I think every team is in the same boat. Every team is so fired up. Like, I know we've in years past made a big effort to come out to the basketball games and um, I'm so excited this year to make that more of a thing. If we can have like fans, I don't really know what the COVID regulations on that will be, but I think that's so exciting to be able to see the other teams. Like I'm pumped to see the other teams in the weight room and see them in the gyms and stuff. And yeah. It's just going to be nice to like see old faces and also meet new people and say, hey, nice to meet you. Like, where are you from? Like, it's going to be nice. Like you said, the interaction is going to be pretty cool. So I'm looking forward to that. So another thing that we've also talked about too on the podcast is like, like I said, it's been so long since we played. Like the last time we played was like almost two years ago. So the nineteen twenty season. So obviously based off that season going to this season, what do you guys think it's going to take for your team specifically to take that next step? Because I think the last time you guys played, you guys had an okay season, but you guys obviously didn't finish it the way you wanted to. So what's it going to take this time around to take that next step to hopefully get into the playoffs and hopefully contend for an OUA championship? I think... You know, I, you've said it, we have, we have new groups here. So this year we, we say we're going in with two groups of rookies, technically. Like last year, the girls had six weeks of on the court. They didn't experience anything of what a real season looks like. Um, and for us to experience success, I think we're, we're in it. We've been working so hard. We've done all the work in the summer. We have six weeks to go. We're going to keep doing that. Um, and starting fresh. Like this, I'm coming in as a fifth year and this feels like my first year. Like I feel like everything's new again and we're doing new things and we have new girls and, you know, we don't have that um, that fresh reminder of the pain of the last season. I feel like that's always something that's in your mind when you're starting new is last season we did this and this and we have so many girls that have no idea. So we just, we have that time to start fresh and show everyone what we've done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no doubt. We've also, I've also asked this question too, but um, because you've been on the team for so long now, you've obviously gone through the experience of year after year being a student athlete. Like you said, there's, and I completely agree, there's two groups of rookies because we had the ones last year that would have played the first year, but didn't get to play, and we also have the ones this year. So based off your experience of being a student athlete, what are the top three things that they need to do to be a successful student athlete, both on, in the classroom and on the court? Okay. 
I'm going to go with time management, number one. And I think people pass over that and don't take it as seriously, but being a student athlete, you guys know, and especially in season, how little time you have for yourself. So learning how to balance their schoolwork, um, their social life, because that's important. You have to balance that into, and then prioritizing your team too. Um, I will say nutrition. I think nutrition is a huge thing to learn in first year. We've been talking about um, doing like a Google Docs where we put all of our favorite recipes up for the girls and stuff. Um, because I know in my first year, I like many first years struggle with learning what to cook for yourself with the kitchens. Um, so learning how to properly feed yourself to be an athlete, like that's a really important thing. Um, and then knowing how to reach out for help. I think that's a good thing. I think first years really struggle with homesickness and stress and anxiety and all that kind of stuff. And just learning who you can go to and not being afraid to go to a coach or a player and tell them you're not okay or that you're struggling with something. So that's it. I'd say you nailed every single one of those. Cause I think I experienced pretty much all of those time yeah. management led me to uh, academic probation first year guys, trust me, academic resources got to get on that stuff right away. They'll help you with like, literally they have time management, like people who actually will help you get better at time management for sure they help you with you know if you have again an injury for per se they'll help you with note taking you know they, they, they pretty much have all the resources so definitely don't overlook the academic um support we have at nipissing yeah man i think too because megan's totally right like time management my first year whew, time management <laughs> I, that was not my vocabulary <laughs> but basically yeah like you said and i think that was the thing that the last year's rookies missed because they had so much time in their hands. So they kind of got into the routine saying, okay, they probably had a false conception. Maybe not, but maybe some of them did that. This is how much time you're going to get in university. No, you guys, you guys are fortunate enough because obviously last year was obviously a mess of a year. So, cause first of all, we didn't even get to go in the locker room last year, which is a huge part of team success because that's where you really get to build a relationship. So you guys can get that. Um, first of all, some of these, second of all, some of these people didn't even see, anything but the athletic center. Like some people on our team told me that, yo, like not only did they not see the locker room, they haven't even seen like the library, the education center, the cafeteria. So it's like so many different things when they come back this year, it's going to be new. It's like, oh my gosh, like this is never seen. It's like, yeah, like all you saw was the athletic center and at much you saw the weight room and the gym. So like you didn't see that much. But basically the question I wanted to ask you is, the thing that I really come to learn over this last year is that you really have to turn your losses into lessons. So basically anything that you kind of made a mistake about, like this past year really gave you the opportunity to think about it, go back and say, okay, I can do this better. So based off your experience from your first year until now that you're looking to hopefully, like say, share with the uh, younger girls on your team, what's the one thing that you knew now that you wish you knew in your first year in terms of how to be a successful student athlete, whether it's on the court, the process, schooling, et cetera, for you personally? a really good question um okay I'll say these kind of go hand in hand but I'm gonna say when you get your syllabus you write out all the days of things that are due in an order so you know when things are due and <laughs> you won't get distracted like I yes literally I write it in an exact note chronological of when is due what so I know when to hand things in and utilize your road trips like I never did homework on the bus but that's like eight hours of time that you can work <laughs> with your teammates and ask them for help and I never did I just slept the whole time so <laughs> do you yeah. like I mean, we talked about this on other podcasts like Jason like what is the likelihood that you actually do homework on the the bus like you might bring your laptop and um, you bring a textbook but then think about it, you get on the bus after a long day you're tired and you want to sleep on the bus then you get to the hotel you're like Oh, but it's best to coach, but I ain't trying to do homework. Then you wake up, and you're like, I'm going to try to do homework. Oh, crap, I have to go to go to Encore. Then you try to come back, like, oh, but I want to eat. Then you try to do homework for, like, maybe 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Like, okay, I'm tired. I need to take my pre nap. Like, when you ever really have time to do homework on the road, it's, like, it's impossible. But, yeah, you're totally right. The, any little summer time you have to do your work, you just try to do it. I know it's not the best, especially if you go to cities like Toronto, where it has, like, a lot of things to do. Like, you have to go to the Ink Center and stuff like that. But if you got if you 
got time. Try to make time. Like, but. If you're a procrastinator, by the time the first one's due, then you'll have like 27 due oh. all at the same time. And you're like, what, what that, just happened? That was me. <laughs> And I was an English major, so I constantly had essays that I was, like, grinding out the night there before they were due, and I was so mad at myself for not doing them earlier, and yeah. Oh, my it's God. It's, like, five, five page minimum. You end up writing two pages. It's, like, yeah. oh, this will do. <laughs> I was the worst, like, procrastinator. Like, I was bad in high school, but high school, you can get away with, like, I would probably wait till the day before. I'm still getting 90s. Like, like my last year, I was straight 90s. That's probably why I had a bad false perception going to university. But never mind that. Like, my first year, there'd be because our practices, Megan, were at late at night. So, like, 8.30 to 10.30, 9 to 11. So, there'd be times specifically where I would stay up. I would actually ask my roommates my first year, say, hey, can you put out your coffee maker for me? Because I'm going to need a couple of cups, a couple of cups. I'm actually serious. I'm going to need a couple of cups of coffee because I'm going to be up all night. And that actually happened. Like I would actually drink like four cups of coffee and be up until three o'clock in the morning doing homework because my time management, my procrastination was terrible. Like for first year, it was yeah. bad. Yeah, so, yeah, I was the same. And I remember always leaving and you guys would be like starting to warm up and I was like, oh, those poor things. <laughs> I couldn't do that. <laughs> oh, that's so what you were talking about, about like nutrition as well and rest. Like people... People forget how important proper rest is to, for like injury prevention, for proper recovery, to actually grow and become like, you know, actually stronger. And then nutrition, if you're too busy rushing to get the homework done and not cooking your meals at the right times of the day. You know, I've, I remember missing like maybe eating once in a day because you end up getting so busy that you're just like, I'm going to have to put it to the side and focus on what's important. Right. And, and cooking on road trips. That's important. Meal prep for a road trip. So you don't spend all your money on Wendy's. I tell Gail, Gail is our, uh, our nutritionist, life coach. She's like our therapist. And I tell her I will cook healthy the whole time, but I am bringing a box of Oreos and I am going to eat them on the bus because that's the only thing I will eat. <laughs> but yeah. meal prep. Yeah, meal prep, is, meal prep is super important. Speaking of that, are there, since you're here, are there any go-to recipes that you got for meal prep? Yeah, I love a pad thai, like a good love making like a peanut sauce with a bunch of veggies and chicken and stuff or salmon i really like to cook so i like to try different things but the bowls are just so easy to meal prep yeah and like and honestly like last year we had like a lot of um stuff in the upper boardroom like like education about nutrition because my first year i cooked a lot Mm -hmm. too but i really learned like the really in in, um the in and outs of like really nutrition because there's so many things like so the carbs and like carbohydrates all the specific stuff i was like oh wow so it's left on yeah, like it, it's super stuck on because a lot of stuff really does contribute to like, you know, how healthy you are, like your bones, like how fragile you are. Like I didn't think of that. I was like, oh, damn, like, that's pretty true. Like because people in my house make fun of me because I have a terrible juice problem. Like I will buy like Sprites and orange juice and apple juice. And, like I drink a lot of Gatorade. So people are like, yo, you got to stop doing that. It's so, like this. Then that's another thing I really focused on this year was like, yo, like I got to cut all that stuff down. Like if I really want to be sure, like, OK, I got to cut off my sugars because I saw like sugar drinks are like really bad because of it um it, like increases like your stomach your fat and so your body fat and stuff like that so, oh wow and another thing too that people don't take into account is a lot of people really want to learn, lose body um belly fat the thing though is that you have to be really persistent with them because a lot of people are really impatient when it comes to um, weightlifting so like they want to lose body fat say within a week and then they don't do it after a week what i saw was that if you're trying to lose body belly fat you will lose you will lose fat, but it will you will lose fat in other parts of your body before it gets to your belly because your belly fat is probably the most stubborn types of fats in your body. So like, and, I, and I'm like, oh, I didn't think of that because I was working all this stuff, you know, doing like weights and like core finishes. I was like, yo, why am I? I'm I'm seeing something, but why am I not seeing stuff like when a week? And then it's it's because like you you might see difference in like in your face, your arms, your chest, your legs before you see your belly. I was like, oh snap! So like. That's something that a tip for people too in general. It's not even just about the the belly fat, but it's like anytime you're trying to do something, like in terms of getting better, whatever it's like your craft or weightlifting, like if you're not you're lifting the, the what you want to, be patient. Hundred percent, you can't rush it, and that's another thing. Like when you're talking about the losing fat, like a lot of people, when you know, the freshman fifteen, you put on some weight. A lot of people end up having that happen. You cannot target body specific fat. It is it is physically impossible to lose. I'm just going to do crunches and that's going to, you know, kill my belly fat. It's full body. The whole thing, it comes and goes. And as we were talking about the carbs, as an athlete, it is so, so essential to get your carbs in. Surprisingly, having fast and like healthy, fast acting carbs actually increases nutrient absorption. So if you're eating healthy as well, while having carbs, so you eat your carbs first and then eat your healthy stuff after, 
it actually is way more beneficial to go in that order instead of saving your carbs for late at night or you know whatever because then you're more hungry as well right because yeah mm-hmm. it's one of the crappy things about carbs but for sure and I think for for women I'm gonna throw this out because this is something that I was dealing with with some of the girls on my team I was talking to a couple of the girls and you know we're working hard working out eating good and I realized that I had gained like 10 pounds since the last time I weighed myself and I had a total freak out that I gained this weight. So I t- called Becca freaking out, talking to her about it. And she was like, Meg, you're gaining muscle. Like, that's what it is. You look the same, you look strong, it's muscle. And I think for girls and guys, especially when you see that you're gaining weight or you see that you look a little bit different, it's immediately to think that you're, you're gaining and you're not healthy and whatever, but gaining muscle is good. Like that's the goal. Right. So exactly. Yeah. And I think it also too, it takes a maturity level because I'm the same way too. Like, honestly, my scale, I'm at home right now at the time that's recording. So I'm pretty sure when this comes out, I'll be back in North Bay. So I haven't had the luxury to really weigh myself in eight months. But like eight times I go to my dad's house, I'm able to weigh myself. So usually I have a tendency to weigh myself every day. And then there was one point last year, like I'm usually around 215 pounds, but I never told the story before. So when we were training last year um, up in North Bay, like through the six, seven weeks before we got shut down, the way we were practicing, like I was scared to actually eat because all, because I was scared that if I ate too much, I was going to throw up in practice. So there actually became a point where I was like 215 for a while. There was one day where I actually won the scale. And because I didn't eat, and this was like for a good two weeks where I didn't eat this much, there was a point where I actually got down to 200 pounds. I had the Whoa. same thing in quarantine. And I noticed in like February, right? Well, like when we came back second semester expecting to play, we weren't. And I had the same thing. Like I just... I wasn't eating like I just I was eating the bare minimum I wasn't cooking for myself as I usually do and I lost a lot of weight and like people were commenting on how I looked good like I lost so much weight but it was not healthy like it was just me not taking care of myself yeah well that's something also people sleep on as well as like your your calorie intake and calorie like if you're in too much of a caloric deficit like people think you have to starve yourself to lose weight by doing that you're actually losing like muscle contractile tissue as well so it's like are you really losing the fat no you're keeping the fat you're losing valuable muscle so the best way to do it is to actually you know taper down very very slowly but most people again like Tasia was saying rush jump the gun and like hey I've been factor on both sides I uh after my injury I got uh, super thick I think I topped out at like 260 and I was like 215 when I started um I you know, like 250 when i met you in my first year like, so i was like legit instead of freshman 15 it was a freshman 50 and then <laughs> i legit was understandable was, you couldn't work out you were very it was just upper body because i couldn't do any legs yeah. and then i immediately was like oh i gotta like i was again i didn't know much like this this year has been like with quarantine has been crazy because i've been way more dialed in on nutrition and fitness but I tried to like i went vegan I cut back on my food so much. And like, I was like nine months vegan, like to the T wouldn't touch anything. I got down to like 223 and I was like, I still look like complete dog crap. I like felt okay, but it was like, whatever. And then over this year of like learning to eat proper, I'm back to like, I'm 250, but it's like like a healthy 250. I have my body fat has gone down drastically and my muscle mass has gone up mm-hmm. but like hey you everybody experiences it and it's a huge learning process and especially for the young folks coming in and they definitely don't rush anything like Tasia was saying trust the process yeah. <laughs> and I think too that comes with like a maturity level because I realized that my first year that I was really cognizant of my weight because I was trying to say okay like, like even if I was like I'm usually like two fit I'm six six like 215 that's usually my weight I'm playing weight even if I get to like 220 I'd be like holy crap like I need to like eat different right like i would go crazy so i think as you get older like i think you your maturity kind of like you improve in terms of like you're more comfortable with your body because like, you realize like hey like throughout the season you might fluctuate like you might go up two pounds one day then down five like it's, it's natural so i think as you go longer do sports career like you said as your nutrition gets better you get a better understanding of how the, your body works and you if you get to a point you realize okay what works for you because yeah. well because so many times people want to give tips and this is something my mentor told me too like in general like she'd be like listen if there's ever a time where like you're, I'm telling you something and it's not helping for you, like you're not getting the benefits from, let me know. So like, there'll be so many times where people will give like nutrition benefits, like you go to nutritionists, like you go to these doctors and they're telling you stuff and you're trying them, but it's not helping for you. 
like you said, Megan, earlier, like sometimes people are just afraid, are afraid to ask for help or are afraid to speak out. And I think it's really important that people realize when it comes to your own body, like you have to realize like, yo, like sometimes you actually have to say, listen, like this is not working for me. Like it may have worked for you, but it's not working for me. Like I need to fix this. So I really hope that anyone listening to this, like listen, listen to your body, trust yourself and always be, have the ability to speak out when you feel like something's going on because so many people are afraid to do that. Exactly. And set goals too. Like I feel like a lot of people, don't go in with a set goal on what they want to do and like for me I I was I remember when it was Chang I was like I just got to get as big as I can as quick as I can because I got to be strong enough to you know handle these older bigger guys but injury comes with that your body can't handle jumping running the lateral movement when you get heavier so that that can come as well if you're too if you become too small or you're like you do too much cardio and you're not putting on the proper weight you end up not performing well and getting you know bodied in our sport at least mm -hmm. so it's always great to come with a mindset of what's your goal in five years not what's your goal in two months <laughs> and work towards that slowly but surely exactly That's a great point. no doubt i want to switch gears a little bit and really get into a serious topic like the main reason why we brought you here is because last year we were talking about before we got in the air but you dropped a bombshell because one of the we always ask the question, like, what's one thing people don't know about you? And then you just drop the bombshell saying, oh, I had cancer five years ago. And we're like, <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. So we have to bring it back on. But in all seriousness, though, um, I really want to give you this opportunity to really tell the, your story because obviously you've clearly come on the other side of it. And there's so many times where people are obviously going through the situation where people don't know if they'll come in on the other side of it. So I just really want to give you the opportunity to tell your story about, you know, what type of cancer you had, um, or what symptoms you had, like how did the whole process came about? And basically it's just your whole process of chemo. Okay, so yeah, so I'm almost five years cancer free. I will be hitting that November 1st, technically. Um, so basically, ha what happened was in 2016, when I was in grade 11, um, it was March break, and I was really, really, really sick. I had the worst cold that I've ever had in my life. And we were going to Florida, and my grandpa noticed like a huge lump on the base of my throat. And my mom was like, that's nothing. I think it's just her lymph nodes. Like, that's what happens when you get sick, like your lymph nodes will swell. So we went to Florida and I was still so sick. I couldn't breathe. Like every time I'd cough, I just, I couldn't get another breath in. So we went to Emerge um, in Florida, which is really expensive, just yeah. so you know, their healthcare. Um, went there and they did a CT scan, um, some blood work and stuff just to check out what was going on said I was fine, said that it was just um, a cyst and nothing to worry about to follow up with my family doctor when I got home, um, but it was just a cold. So went home, was fine. A few months later, followed up with my doctor. Um, in August of that year, we went and got it aspirated. So they put a huge needle in my neck and like drained it to test what was wrong with it. Um, and then we found out in September that uh, I had cancer and I remember when I was so I coached the junior boys volleyball team at my high school um and I was in the gym with the boys it was their first game and they were so excited and my mom called me um saying that the doctor called and I needed to be there right now and something just clicked like I knew what it was and I broke down on the court and I just sobbed because I was so stressed out and I went to the doctor and um, he told me one, that the state's doctors messed up and that on their CT scan, cause they gave me the CD that told me like what was wrong with it. Okay. Um, and on the CD scan, it said the cells look abnormal, might be cancerous. And they didn't tell me that. So I'd gone on for six months without not, without knowing anything, but they had written that down. Yeah. So, um, so he said that it looked like it was thyroid cancer um, didn't even know what a thyroid was. I had no idea what that was. So I was so confused, but basically what it is, is it's a, a gland in the base of your neck and it controls your metabolism, your mental health, your hormones, your like everything that you think it does. It does. Okay. Um, but the tricky part about thyroid cancer is they can't diagnose you until they take out your thyroid. So that was the gamble was they can't tell you for sure until they do surgery so at that point I didn't think like I was in so much denial it didn't feel real like I was fine it was nothing 
like it was just a shock to me and at this point I'm in grade 12 so this was my like senior year I was so excited and then they dropped that bomb on me so yeah so that happened I'm just gonna keep going and you guys can go go ahead um and then we started meeting with some doctors I wanted to make sure I was going with the right doctor that um I connected with and it worked out my aunt was the um, head of human resources at women's college in downtown so she got me in with a thyroid doctor that was all she did the only surgery she did was for thyroids so I went to her like really really liked how she how she worked um and booked my surgery for November 1st and um it all happened really really quickly because it was aggressive because of how long I had had it and not known anything um so I started, I had my surgery November 1st and I'll backtrack. I didn't tell anyone that I had cancer. I told um, two of my good friends, but I didn't want anyone else to know. Like I told some teachers just so they knew when I was away and stuff, but I just, I didn't tell family, like grandparents knew, but no extended family knew. And it was just, I didn't want to be known as sick. Like that was a huge thing for me. And um, being an athlete, like I just, I didn't want to be viewed differently in that. I wanted to still be taken seriously. I was uh, trying to get scouted so I didn't want that to to hinder anything and I was just so stressed that people would look at me differently so that was a huge part of my denial because I didn't really talk about it and it didn't it didn't feel real for me um until after one appointment when they like right before my surgery they were going over exactly what happened and it just kind of sunk in that I actually did have cancer um and I remember biting my my cheek trying not to cry in the office and just left and broke down with my dad and I was so so stressed obviously you're young and you're going through something like that so I did that um had surgery and I remember right before my surgery my volleyball team none of them knew um and right before our first tournament the the moms came in and they did this speech and I had no idea what was going on um and then they slowly kind of said someone on our team is dealing with a health problem and I just started crying because I knew it was about me yeah um and they showed a t-shirt and they had made t-shirts for all the girls that said winter's warriors with a thyroid cancer symbol on it and stuff right before my thing. So I was, I lost it. Wow. Um, but it was really nice knowing that, that they had my back. And then I went in and I chose, so with thyroid cancer, you can choose to have half of it removed or the full thing removed. So it's think? like a, but, it's like a butterfly. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. The diagram of it. Mm-hmm. So the risk was if you do half of it and it's cancer, they have to go back in and take the other half. So I said, no, we're doing, we're all in one go, like take it all out. Um, I, I'm on medication. That was the, what happens. They took it out. And then I, I'm on meds every day. I take a, a pill in the morning and it regulates my thyroid levels. Um, went in for surgery and everything was, everything was good. I, I remember I was like day three post-op and I went to volleyball practice because I just wanted to sit in the gym and see the girls. And I was in my pajamas. I didn't care. I just didn't want to be at home. I wanted to be in my happy place on the court. Um, And then going back to your question earlier, I actually didn't have to do chemo. Um, So that's, no, that's one of the ways they, so chemo doesn't respond or thyroid cancer doesn't respond to chemo. They never want you to hear anything. No. So it doesn't respond to chemo. And so that was, thank God I didn't have to do that. I'm so thankful. Um, what they do instead is it's called radioactive iodine. Three months after my surgery, I went in for this treatment. No idea what it was, but what I had to do was for 14 days before I went in for treatment, I had to have a no sodium diet. It's called a low iodine diet. So basically you starve your body of salt. So the only things I could really eat was like fruits, vegetables, on like chicken with absolutely no seasoning on it. It was the worst thing ever. So going back to earlier, I lost a ton of weight because I wasn't eating anything. Yeah. And then went to the hospital. And so because they starve your body of sodium, they give you an iron pill, which is like a radiation pill. And what it does is it goes into your body and it goes through, it finds all the, the thyroid cells that are still there. Mm-hmm. So because it was an aggressive cancer, they didn't know if it had spread and it's really hard to tell if it spread anywhere. So the pill goes in and it e- eats all the cancer cells that are still there. So for that, and it makes me think of quarantine because what I did was they put me in the hotel room or in the, in the hospital room and the, the radiologist rolled in this huge vat of like, um, 
metal and the pill was in the middle of this huge thing. So he pushed it into my room and said, you need to open it. You take the pill. I can't be in there. So I was like, okay. <laughs> so I took the pill and then I was shut in the hospital room for three days because the radiation would hurt anyone that was close to me. So I stayed there for three days and like the nurses would bring me food and knock on my door and then I would wait five minutes and go and get my food <laughs> and then um, got home and I had to be 10 days isolated in my room. So like my family couldn't come upstairs or be around me at all because the radiation would hurt them. Like it wasn't safe for them to be around me. Yeah. So I really got some practice for this COVID stuff <laughs> by doing that. Um, and then I did that treatment again in my first year of university as, again, just as like a, a backup, just to make sure everything was good. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much the timeline of my treatment and what happened when I had it. Question, original question I have, Jason, let me ask first before you ask your question. How hard was, especially being, I think, when you happened, you were 16 going to 17 when it first happened, right? Like 16, 17? Yeah, yes. It was yeah. in between 16 to 18. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How, how hard was it on your mental health? Especially, like you said, with all the stuff that's going on, like how hard was it for you personally on your mental health? Because it must have been a battle. It, it's hard to think. At that time, I didn't, like, I was in so much denial. Like, I didn't think about it. I obviously was stressed. I had so many appointments I was constantly in. And I, uh, because I didn't tell people and I didn't have it, like, very known, I didn't think about it very much because no one really talked about it. And it just wasn't, I was going for surgery and I was going for the treatment and I was done. Um, I know my parents were really stressed. I remember, like, hearing my mom crying and stuff like that. And she was stressed. So I, tried to just be strong for them so I think I just kind of like bottled everything up um and it didn't really hit me until like two years later and like I would say now it's been worse because I think when you have cancer and you're fine like you don't have it anymore you're in remission people are like that's amazing that's great like that's so happy and it is but I stress every day that it's gonna come back or like I go for um, follow-up appointments every six months. I have my scans. I have blood work every three months. And every time I'm just petrified that something's going to like come back or they were watching for a few nodules in my neck last year. And I was just so stressed that anything would show up again. And it's just like this constant fear that something's going to come back. So that's what I'm dealing with more now than I was back then. Uh, but yeah. And isn't there, um, I think, isn't it like 10 or 15 years before they can like fully say like 100% cancer free? Yeah, it's I think five years they can say you're like, I'm in remission technically is what they say now. And they mm -hmm. usually do that to five years. Okay. Um, but it takes a long time for them to be able to say fully. And I know once you have cancer once, you have like double the chance of getting a different type of cancer again later. So it's just it's stressful yeah yeah take me take me through the day or the around the time when you found out like it was gone i remember um i was still in grade 12 so that was it was after my uh my radiation treatment and i my mom and i went together and it just it, it didn't feel real like i it was hard to believe that it was gone, especially with thyroid cancer, because they don't know for sure if it's gone. Like, it's not like other types where they could say you're completely good. Like it's all gone like that because the cells are so small, they could have gone anywhere in your body. Right. Um, which is why I've done like full body scans and everything just to make sure nothing else is um, turning into anything. Um, but it was just the best. And I remember telling all my friends that at that point, a lot of them knew um, that I was good and it was just, still looking back on it now I uh I wrote a letter I remember grade my grade 12 essay was a comparative essay and I wrote it to grade 9 me from grade 12 me and grade 12 year was the best year of my high school life like that's what I said and I still believe that that was the best year of high school because I didn't let it stop me like I still lived grade 12 like it was the last year and it was still the best year of high school to me now looking back to Oh, that's crazy. Seriously. Crazy. Yeah. I'm just at a loss of words. That's crazy. Yeah, like, it's, um, it's, I, don't know. My, I, have, I have a personal question, but I just want to get Jason the floor. There's a six. It's just something like when I, like, I, 
uh, until well, hearing you and then I've had one buddy that I went to high school with. He was two years older than me. I think he just had Hodgkin's lymphoma and just beat it. But like when I'm like younger, it's like heart attacks, strokes and cancer. I'm like, there's those don't affect people our age. Like I'm just like at that age, I'm like, that's for like older people. And then once I'm like where I am now, it's like, holy heck, like you don't realize like how many people these these like health conditions can affect. And it's just like, holy. You don't. Yeah. It's just no. and, and I didn't either. And I think something I struggled with then and maybe why well, I didn't tell people I know thyroid cancer, thank God, when as soon as I was diagnosed, they said, you should be thankful that it's thyroid cancer because you're like your prognosis is so much better than if you were to have anything else, which at the time, that's not what you want to hear. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't want you to be telling me right. that I should be thankful to have this type of cancer, right, right. but it was hard to come to terms with that because you f- I felt almost guilty to be proud to say that I was cancer free because I didn't have to do chemo. I didn't have like one of like the horrible cancers. So it, it was hard to deal with. Yeah. I can still be proud of that just because I didn't have a horrible prognosis, you know? Yeah. That makes sense. No, that, that makes sense. But honestly, too, like this is the reason why I wanted you to come back on because we really wanted you to share this story because there's so many people who go through that same situation. And like, even like I said, even if it's like the least like deadly cancer, whatever case it be, it's still cancer. Yeah. Like, like your parent, you like it's it's funny too. But when even if it's like any illness, like even like when you were going through cancer, like your family was going through cancer. Like everyone that was close to you had to go through the same. Like I said, when you were crying and like you were breaking down, like they have to go through that too. So I'm pretty sure there was nice, like I said, when you're in your room, like going to bed, you're worried. I'm pretty sure they're, they're in the next room are crying just as much, if not more, because my baby girl has cancer, right? So. And they are. Yeah. Like, I think exactly. both of us were trying to be strong for the other person exactly. and it just it didn't work. Exactly. Yeah. I'm a big thing on mentorship and I'm a big thing on really sharing your story. And that's like I said, that's why I want to have you on. So I really want to give you this opportunity to give you a scenario. And then you obviously can use your expertise to help someone. So this, here's the scenario. 16 year old girl going through the exact same thing you went to. If you had the opportunity to write a letter to that girl, what would, what would it be the letter? Well, that's tough. I would tell them to tell people. Um, I wish that I had told more people and not only just told more people, but told more people that I was scared. Like I didn't really talk to my parents and tell them how scared I actually was of what I was going through. I really bottled it up and I felt it now that it's coming out more like now um, to talk to people about what you're going through. Um, And just know that you're not alone and that you're in good hands with your doctors Um, to take, to like do things that you still love to do. Um, I know for me, like, volleyball was the one thing that uh got me out through it and the first day that they told me I had cancer when I left the gym with the boys I rushed right back there and sat on the bench like I didn't go home and freak out I that was my happy place and it still is it's the place where I can't I don't have to think about what's going on outside and everything is out the window when I'm on the court and so I have to keep doing things that that you're happy about and know that you're stronger than you think that you are because I didn't think that I was strong, <laughs> but now I'm very proud of it. And, and now I'm not ashamed to talk about it. And I'm very open with, with what I've been through and it just made me stronger. So. You have any other questions, Jason? I think we hit everything. But I just want to even know. Like, I'm still just taking it all in. Like, wow. Yeah. Is it, um, yeah. like, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't even think you could be upset having to like, take the medication anymore because it's like you you survived like yeah, you yeah that, was, that was another thing um the right after having it it's so they don't tell you it takes a long time for your body to find the right dose so I was constantly getting my doses changed and um like my weight was up like I gained 20 pounds I lost 20 pounds like I, they just couldn't find the right dose your mental health was screwed like I've had I'm medicated for anxiety now because of that, like I have very bad anxiety from everything, which um, is understandable. Um, and you don't realize how hard it was to find the right dose. So now I'm on a dosage that I've been on for a year or so now, and it's good. Like I remember when it was really bad, it, I was so tired. I would go to school and I would come home and I would sleep until I woke up the next day to go to school. Like I wouldn't eat dinner. I was right to bed um, and still went through that in university. And my roommates would be like, are you okay? Like you're, I think you need to get your blood work checked because you're sleeping a lot. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, but now I'm on a good dose and 
it's easy to take it in the morning. It's nothing. Yeah. If people, if people don't tell you enough, Megan, like just hearing your story, like if you can, your strength is like, is, you can just, I can see it. So like, if people don't tell you enough, Megan, you're really, an, you're really an incredible person. I just really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story because that's Fox. why I wanted to come back on because we really wanted you to share your story. There's so many people go through this stuff and like the real in-depth stuff that you touched on, people don't really talk about what well, they do sometimes, but like they talk about, you know, the big stuff, you know, but like chemo, stuff like that. But the real in-depth stuff they talk, you know, with the mental health and not telling people about it. Like those are the type of things that are really going to help people listen to this podcast and really take from it, especially if they're going through that situation. So please, if you ever, I don't know if you have, it's just because like we still get to know each other all this last year, but if you haven't, anytime you have a chance to share your story, please share your story. Like people- Yeah. People- and I think that's what I learned. I remember um, I was still, so I was being recruited during all of this. And I remember I had signed to Nipissing and I was in the hospital. I was doing my, my treatment and I had gotten the email of, you know, when they do the promo, like, congrats, she signed that. Yeah. So I was, I was filling out all of my, my questions and I was like, oh my God, this, my coach doesn't even know that I'm in the hospital while I'm filling this out. And I made, I had a post. Um, so I got a bracelet. This, I wear this every day. Um, it's not appropriate. It swears on it, but I still like it. <laughs> I'll show you. Can you read that? Oh yeah. That's so, awesome. So That's I have awesome. my bracelet that I wear every day. So I made a post when I was determined it was all gone. Um, and I was like, oh God, my, the volleyball account follows me. So now I'm going to have to tell my coach. <laughs> so I called Mark and I was like, look, okay, I'm sure you saw the post. I'll run you through it. And he was like, yeah, like I was waiting for you to want to tell me what was going on and told Mark about it and everything. And he was awesome. And he still is like, knows I've had to leave. Like I've had to go home on reading week when we're supposed to be there for treatments and scans and all that. And he's been the best and still we'll go to him or the girls and talk to them about it and they've been a support system through it all so yeah yeah it just made me stronger got my tattoo from it I have a tattoo that says with pain comes strength and that was like the only thing that got me through everything so yeah I'm definitely proud of it now nice well seriously Megan really appreciate you coming on and sharing story like that like it's an amazing story so now we're getting to a quicker segment. So this is the part of the podcast where us to get the question and it's answered as fast as possible. But the trick to this one is Megan actually did the same quick hitters last season. So this is the price, Megan. We completely switched up the quick hitters for you. So these are never before asked questions on the. Oh way- gosh, I thought you were gonna say I got a second chance at answering them. <laughs> <laughs> questions. And these are going to be pretty fun. I'm actually, honestly, me and Jason were talking about it before this, that we might actually ask you some of these in our regular quick hitters. Okay. So Jason, got the questions ready? Ready whenever you are, man. All right. First question, Megan, what's your favorite shortest, what's your favorite store to shop at? My favorite store to shop at? Um, Lululemon. Easy. Okay. If you had to stay on a deserted island, what three things are you taking with you? Oh, that's good. Um, we switch it up. <laughs> I'm going to bring on, can it be a human being? That's fine. Yeah. yeah. Bring on Survivor Man. Okay. So smart. I would have never thought of that. <laughs> right? We just have to survive. Um, I'm going to bring a book because you're going to be bored. Yeah. Um, and hmm, I feel like you need like fresh water. Like that's the most important thing. I was saying water purifier. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of those. Yeah. Okay. Have you ever read the book, The Hatchet? No. Yeah, no? No. No. So there was a book about it that I remember reading in like elementary school. And I remember watching the movie. It literally is like sums up this question. If you ever get the chance to read it, I would have 100% okay. read it. Read it. Read it. Read it. Uh, next question. This is probably a cool one for me. What's a song that you'll never forget the lyrics to? Ooh. Um, Piano Man. That, I know that entire song. Love that one. Yeah, nice. Uh, you got the next one, Jason. Uh, one word to describe your freshman self. Oh, insecure. I said yeah, so. I was really insecure. Yeah. I said something. Just what'd you say again? I can't say it on here. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, bro, whatever. All right, all right. Next question. If you could have one superpower, what would it be and why? I was actually thinking about this a while ago, too um i don't know i I couldn't answer the question i have no idea i'm gonna go with teleportation 
Ooh, that's because cool. I hate flying in planes. So if I could just snap my finger and be somewhere new, that would be good. Definitely. I'm gonna shake this up. This I didn't know about until I talked. I actually I talked to my dad about this question before, and then he's a Star Trek junkie. Omnipotence. Have you ever heard of that term before? Okay, I've heard of it, but I don't know. What you I can mean. control time, space, and matter. So basically, you can teleport. Say you say like you wanted to like live forever. You can make whoever else want to live forever. You could duplicate the planet on the other side of the solar system, so no one could see it and have a fresh start. Like, see, that's a G answer. You got it all in that <laughs> one. That's that's what I'm saying. That's a... <laughs> that's like saying grenade and rock paper scissors. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, next one is question number six. Um, would you rather be a billionaire and buy anything you want or be the president and change any laws you want? Ooh. Oh, that's a really good question. I saw that. Would you rather? Oh, I got to put this in. Um, <laughs> I guess prime minister because we're in Canada. I love, I love would you rather. I love that game. So I have to put it in. I would say a billionaire because you have I could spend so much money on helping people. Like a yeah. billion is so much money that I could just do like help people Charity and charities i'm with you yeah since, since you are a book person <laughs> what's a series where you loved the book but didn't like the movie as much Ooh, i told you we were making good a good one just like that's know. really hard oh my gosh um i can't say harry potter because i i love those movies and i there's i'm gonna say there's not many that i prefer the movies but i really like the harry potter movies oh, i'm it. looking at my bookshelf to see <laughs> i've never I would watched say... harry potter believe it or not never watched harry potter Neither have I. I fell asleep to the first one within the first 10 minutes i never watched the full harry potter movie either. I'm yeah. Gonna, yeah, oh my god <laughs> i just <laughs> lost a little respect for you guys <laughs> i started to watch the last divergent i think it's allegiance okay watch- that's what i was gonna say the divergent series the movie is yeah, listen, I like the movie, but I will say that the book is better than the first book is it better is. than the first movie because there's so it many is. things that are a little bit different. Like, the book's better, so I'm with you. On that. I, yeah. I don't think I've ever seen that either, to be honest. You gotta watch it, trust me. It's it's fine. Like, the, movie okay. is still, the movie's still, in my opinion, 8.5 out of 10, but the book is still a little bit better than the movie. But they didn't film the rest of the books, that's what really bugged yeah, me. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, they, they just continued it on from like the first one, like out of their own plot. It's, it's yeah, we're not gonna get into that. Uh, <laughs> it, it's too much, Jason. You got a question? Um, okay, yeah. If you could bring a fictional movie or book character to life, who would it be? I could bring them to life? Like yep. a movie or a book character? Yep. Um, Lisa said, what do you, what do you from Toy Story? Is that, <laughs> that or the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Those are good answers. I don't know who I bring back. I don't know. I, I just think about it. That's a really good question. Um... I don't know if I'd bring them to life. like there are any people, but I, I'd say Thor. Thor is pretty cool. Thor, that'd be crazy though. Imagine he went rogue, man. Just right, Ooh. wipes it. <laughs> 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 All right, this you also got question number nine. Okay, if you could change the ending to a book or movie, which one would it be and why? You guys really threw all the book ones at me. If I could change the ending. Um, one more back I think of and I would maybe change the ending. That's only one. Okay, tell me what one would you change? Me? Oh, I yeah. said, I mean, you, you know, Camp Rock, the movie Daniel the Battle was in? <laughs> yeah. So I would change Camp Rock too and I would actually make them win the final jam and not lose it. Oh, <laughs> that's good. Only one I can think of. <laughs> so wow. Not lose it. That's the only one I can think of. I would say that I would change the divergent ending, but I'm not going to spoil it because if Tazon hasn't read the third book, then I'm not going to spoil it for anyone. I've read the third book. I haven't watched the third movie. Like, I still have to watch it, but I watched the first two. I watched the Divergent and a Surgeon. I watched both. They don't even have the third movie. They never made it. I swear they made a Legion. I swear Legion. No. Are you? I, I, swear, think... I swear Legion's the third movie. I swear. Maybe they did, but, well, okay. Maybe they did, it. But the book ending needed to go with them. It was the worst okay. ending I've ever read in my entire life. All good. All good. Uh, I'll ask the last two questions. So this one I thought of, which I think is really cool. If you wrote a song about your life, which famous artist would you want singing it? Ooh, ooh, that's good. Um, I'm proud of myself for thinking that one. I wrote a song about my life. Who would I choose? Um, I'd say Luke Combs. I'd make him sing it for me. Oh, 
I don't know why. I, just, I thought you. I thought you were gonna say Christina Aguilera or something. Like that. I don't know why. No, no, she's cool. I like her in burlesque. <laughs> Not funny. Now, would you make him stick to a country, or would you like throw him some? Pop? Yeah, like a good. Yeah, yeah, a country, a country like a good slow song. Like you know that word. It's very hearty. Something like yeah. that. Very soulful. Yes. Okay. Uh, final question: What's an activity that you'll never do? Ooh, that'll never do. Um. So people can tell you to try it, you'll never do it. <laughs> like me, Jason, like I said, I will never bungee jump, I'll never skydive. I was just thinking that. I was thinking either bungee jumping or like honestly the CN Tower or the walk around thing. Oh <laughs> yo, I have a I have a scenario though. Okay, you have two options. Okay. You have to do one of those where you're like free walking or bungee jumping off of like a stupid high height. Or you ever seen those caves, the guys that go through the caves? Where they're like this tight and they're like maneuvering. Okay, like no, guys I'll have gotten stuck. <laughs> I'll you, take you the jump. I remember you take I the jump over that. Yeah, can, I yeah. yeah, I take the jump. Easy. Yeah, I was gonna add this question, but let me add another book question. Cause remember we talked about the song. Okay, here's a, here's another question. If you could, if you could write a book about your life, what would be the name of the book? Ah, that's a hard question. I want to add your that. tattoo. Your tattoo could be the title of the book. Oh, don't say it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I would do that. Oh, you know what it is? You can honestly name it what they said in the You can name it Winter's Warriors. You can name it that. Your book. That's true. <laughs> you can oh, name- look at you guys. Now I have to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about a book with you too, but I, I talked to someone like, oh, it's so much work and like, like you don't get a lot of money from it. I was like, oh. I know. I always want to be an author, but it's just yeah. I'll credit you if I write a book. And <laughs> 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 but that's all the time that we have. So Megan, man, I really enjoyed this episode. Thank you so much for coming on like, again and really answering this phone quicker. Than, like, me and Jason really appreciate you coming back on. Bye. Me too. Thank you guys so much for having me and letting me tell my story. I've never said it all out there, so I feel really good. Oh, that's out there now. That's awesome. That's cool. And good luck with your season. I'm excited to watch you guys play this season. Thank you. You Bye. too. I'm so excited. And Jason, good luck in wherever you're going. <laughs> <laughs> I will be making an appearance to uh, to watch everybody play. So no doubt, no doubt. I will definitely end up seeing you guys again. <laughs> nah, no doubt. And that's a wrap on another edition of the Lakers Locker. I want to thank our reappearing guest, Megan Winter, for joining us. You can find the videos interview on YouTube and listen to the full interview on all podcast streaming platforms. Peace.